Good morning. Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Poggi, and it is my pleasure to be speaking to you today with Scott Simo out of the Patent Pittsburgh office. And we are honored to have our patent colleague helping with the final of this part of the series, Behavior Bites. The content that we are dedicating today to is de-escalation and how we can work through cool down tactics. We're hoping we give you some really great strategies. So go ahead, Scott, if you want to go ahead and advance. So the presenters today, as indicated, will be myself and Scott, and we are best connected with the Patent Pittsburgh office, the western side of the state. Anytime you come to a patent event, we always start out with the mission, and our mission is captured on this slide, and it is truly dedicated to our ability to build the capacity of local educational agencies to make sure that we are best serving students with special education services. With COVID-19, obviously, we're glad that this audience is extended. and We're going to be working closely to help families, agencies, all the folks that are able to connect virtually have access to this information. In addition, every time we host a patent event, we always work through the least restrictive environment. And the big idea with that is captured on this slide. And that is essentially ensuring that we are working with all IEP supports and anything that is already in place before we consider anything of a more restrictive nature. So a couple just tools to help you become familiar with the virtual environment that we're using today. You have a screenshot in front of you that allows you to start or stop your video and also muting controls. We have found with bandwidth that sometimes it's easier to stop video if you start to find that your dialogue or sometimes the audio is being interrupted. You also have the opportunity that you can work through the chat feature, which is that top bubble that is um, item six at the top of your screen. And then this slide allows you to just really speak a little bit to engagement. So at any point throughout the course of today's presentation, you may raise your hand or you could indicate if you have a question. We also are a very user-friendly group, so we certainly welcome if you would like to convey questions to us through the chat. I will be working closely to monitor that and to answer any questions that may be coming in in real time. So without further ado, this Behavior Bite series all started as just an idea and a brainstorm. And we were so happy and thankful that the traction and the interest in it has really grown exponentially. We do have a material and resource page that is accessed via the tiny URL you have right there on your screen. You also are able to access this information through our extension of educational resources on the patent behavior homepage. But within that, you'll be able to go into folder June 2nd to access this PowerPoint if you'd like to utilize it or go back as a refresher after today's discussion. So as with everything that we do with PBIS and behavior, we always like to work off of a matrix. And the matrix that we're utilizing today is essentially we want to be respectful and responsible to our other parties that are joining us. So if you haven't already done so, just ensure that you're monitoring your mute button. Be aware of your camera and any background distractions or things that might be visible. And as indicated too, if you have any questions or anything that you would like to relate to us, know that you can utilize our chat feature. We will be making every effort to respond to questions and to ensure that you leave today feeling well equipped with some de-escalation strategies. The learning targets and the things that we would like to prioritize today deal with looking at the range of behaviors that you may encounter. And when this content was developed, we looked at it from a classroom lens. So the individual learning context and how a youth may go from a calm, modulated and attentive state to actually an escalated state in an area where uh, we need to really intervene quickly to make sure that all parties maintain safety. In addition, we wanna make sure that we are modeling and we are able to really be that barometer for our youth so at the earliest sign or detection, if you see a youth is escalating, how we can model calm and hopefully translate, everything's gonna be okay. And we're going to make sure that we can get the scenario turned around before something becomes serious. Number three, we wanna make sure that you're looking at prevention and what we can do from a preventative role 
that kind of connects to classroom management and some of the other behavior bites that we hope you had an opportunity to view and how you can make sure if we learn maybe what is a trigger for our learners that we can help minimize that for future examples or future incidences. And lastly, number four, we want to make sure that we are helping and allowing you to explore effective strategies that you can use right there within your context, either within the school setting or at home for the parents that are joining us to diffuse any challenging behavior that may manifest. So when we think about our youth and we think about the behaviors that they may be bringing to our instructional settings, this graphic I found was very powerful. And with that, we always have to keep within our mind's eye that some difficulties are visible, some things we were able to see. However, other difficulties are not. This graphic pertains to the adverse childhood experience study. And it just allows all of us as the adults that are intervening with youth for us to think about, you know, sometimes if a youth is coming from a difficult environment or even sadly an abuse-based environment, there's visible signs. But there's an entire undercurrent that we need to make sure that we're looking at and we need to make sure that we are offering supports and with that those could also be triggers to their behavior in any context and also could be something that could make things a little bit more pronounced if a task demand or a less preferred activity is entered into if they're already coming into that environment in not the most resilient state so we do encourage you if you'd like to extend that please check out the ACE scale and the Adverse Childhood Experience information. Next, we also want to make sure that we're connecting everything that we're doing from a behavioral lens back to the overarching MTSS. So this is a multi-tiered system of support graphic. And with that, it shows that we are doing everything we can with our interventions to make sure that it is equitable and accessible to all students. And with that, there are so many moving parts. We know with MTSS, there's an academic side and a behavior side that has been long standing our graphic. But what we also see is we have now layered in the ever important social emotional learning component. And with that, until we look at social emotional responses and the resilience of our youth, their academics and their behaviors will be impacted. And we will see manifestations of how they are able to readily engage with their peers, with us as the adult staff, and also the instructional content. To be able to do that effectively, we need to make sure that we can definitively identify what that problem is and how we can analyze or drill into the function of why that behavior is happening and then utilizing interventions that we can implement with efficacy. And today's content will relate to that. And lastly, everything that we do is data-driven. So the evaluative steps that we're going to take to make sure that the interventions that are in place best fit our youth best fit the scenario or the function of that response and set them up for success. So when we think about the three-tiered model and Pennsylvania's view of MTSS, again, we're going to do everything we can from a preventative lens. And you will see examples of that through today's shared dialogue. You will see in the lower quadrant, 80% of our students should be able to respond successfully to preventative steps. So classroom management is going to certainly fall within that. We are also going to be able to work through that relational component and make sure that we have rapport in place and we have an understanding of what may be prior triggers and we can start to try to think about how can we set up our learners for success? Are we able to pre-teach expectations for behavior and also model that appropriate cool down or that appropriate modulation? if behaviors do become more of a difficult challenge. But from today's lens, we really wanna look at things from a preventative perspective. In addition to the MTSS lens, we know we have the triangle with each of the tiers, but we also have many moving parts that are connected to that. And data teaming and working through evidence-based strategies are critical. So this slide is really just a depiction that if you're coming in it from a school lens or from a team-based lens, we encourage you to consider. The first row is that universal tier and everything that we're doing from a preventative lens. The second row is what is dealing with the targeted or our yellow zone when we think about our MTSS tiers of support. And with that, how we're working through targeted supports that may be group-based. Moving over to the kind of orangish 
colored the third component, that still falls within an advanced tier lens, but that's more of a problem solving scenario. And with that, that's that data component. When we had the slide just a moment ago that talked about coming up with interventions and looking at efficacy, we need to ensure that when you're doing these interventions, you have a problem solving team that is situated. And those folks are best suited to be able to think about how many students do I have in an intervention at any given time? How is the efficacy of that intervention going? And what is the data yielding? Am I yielding that I can get my youth in within that golden 72 hour period of time when a referral happens? And then with that, is the intervention being able to be rolled out timely? And are we able to then also fade our supports in an appropriate manner? Lastly, we have the very last column, which is that red column, and those are tertiary supports. When we look at a typical MTSS distribution, that should be one to 5% of our student population. And that very well could be the youth that is acting out in a dangerous modality. And that could be what you think about in your own mind's eye, why this is a topic that's of interest. Because you know that you have had some students that have acted out or presented dangerous behaviors and this is where we really want to look at individualized supports and with that function-based thinking with an individualized intervention that matches up. So let's talk behavior. Well, anytime we talk behavior, we always want to make sure that we can get ahead of it before it becomes a real problem or something that is a chronic scenario. And Dr. Rob Horner, who has been an amazing friend of Pennsylvania and works closely with us out of the University of Oregon, has always said, it's so much easier to prevent a problem before it happens than to circle back and deal with it afterwards. And that is truly the key to success. So with that, we're hoping that you leave today with the, the drive and the onus that you will really want to know your learners and to really be able to identify triggers. So when we think about behavior, it really drills down into the ABCs. And we're gonna take just a momentary glance down memory lane of what that means. A is always referring to antecedent. So that pertains to the behavior or the set of conditions that happens right before a challenge of behavior is manifested. So when you think about your instructional context, that could be a change in routine, that could be a request, that could be a instructional demand, but it's always what happens immediately before. B pertains to behavior. And with that, that is usually what gets our biggest amount of attention. Behavior is always something that is observable and it is measurable. So when we think about that, we need to think about if I look at this behavior, am I able to describe it efficiently? And also if Scott, who will be speaking to you momentarily, looks at it, are we both op operating off of the same operational definition? That is the target behavior that drives an intervention development. And C is consequence. And I always say to teams, you know, consequence is one of those unique words because it has a negative connotation, but really consequences can be very much from a positive lens and they can shape up and reinforce behaviors and allow us to see more of a behavior that we'd like to see. On the flip side, consequences can be a punisher, but from a behavioral lens, it is always what happens immediately after the behavior of concern. And with that, there is a result in our learner. So it's either going to sustain that behavior and reinforce it, or it's going to mitigate it and diminish it. It's something that happens immediately after. So for everything that we do, we always need to look at it from a function-based lens. And we challenge you to think about that. Behaviors always serve a function. And it is usually for our youth to either gain access to something or to avoid it. So you'll see in the left-hand column, when we think about behaviors, try to link that up with the mindset. This learner is doing this because they either want to gain something or avoid something. Every behavior that we do do though, does serve a purpose. So let's think about it. When you go through today's content and you think about some of the strategies that Scott will talk us through in a moment, think about behaviors that you readily see or think about a behavior that is of concern. And with that, try to think in your mind's eye, okay, was there truly a function that was linked up to that? Yeah, I do believe this youth was demonstrating this to either gain access to peer attention or an adult level response, or yeah, it makes sense. They were probably trying to avoid transitioning into that less preferred activity. 
that'll help this content make sense. So lastly, this is the last component that I'm going to formally talk about. And this is just the charge or the carrying of the torch. We want you to always set your learners up for success. So with that, really taking the time and working through the component of knowing what are triggers. Many a times with that preventative lens, that classroom management side, we can situate tasks that we know that are more preferred and less preferred in an order that is going to set our learners up for success. So if a task is less preferred and we usually know that a learner sometimes pushes back, we may have a promised reinforcer. We're going to work through this activity and then immediately after we're going to do this. Another way that we can make it real user friendly is think about grandma's law. If you eat all of your peas and your vegetables, we're gonna have hot fudge sundaes for dessert. But we can situate preferred and less preferred activities in a way that really allow our learners to be successful. And with that, I'm going to turn the content over to Scott. He's gonna walk us through some de-escalation details. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for uh, Dr. Poggi and I to be with you today. Um, as you can tell, we have a pretty ambitious schedule with regards to the, the amount of content we had given you to talk about de-escalation. However, we did feel that it was very important to review all of the critical aspects of MTSS, PBIS especially, and the different types of instructional considerations for in-classroom behaviors for students before we get to a point where we talk about de-escalation. So when we talk about de-escalation, essentially what we're talking about is to decrease or to minimize the challenging behavior or the intensity of that behavior that we're seeing in the student or concerned about. Also that the actions taken up front to prevent the challenging behaviors from becoming more escalated. So as Catherine said, we wanted to definitely take a look more at a preventative type of a procedure. So in a summary, when we link de-escalation to MTSS, we do wanna make sure that we have a good solid PBIS framework in place. We wanna make sure we have core teams that are meeting at tier one, tier two, and tier three. We wanna make sure that we have data collection processes, that we're analyzing data, that we're creating interventions, we're monitoring progress. And then as Catherine eloquently talked about, when we take a look at functional behavioral assessment, the purpose of that is to isolate the function of the behavior, to learn more about the behavior because the goal is to make the student successful. And oftentimes we have to be that group of people that help the student realize the behavior that's taking place, how to follow the expectations, and then how to be rewarded for the behaviors that we would like to see. Also, in times when Catherine talked about the ACEs chart, we also have situations where we do need um, our SAP teams included, especially for advanced tier support, mental health, services as well as trauma-informed care procedures want to be in place as a part of our program even before we get into the part of de-escalation. Some of the things that we're taking, going to take a look at when you think of de-escalation de training, I'm sure a lot of you have participated in safety care as well as CPI. When we look at the different phases of behavior, we think of seven particular phases. We think of calm, trigger, agitation, acceleration, peak, de-escalation and recovery. When we start out, we're typically in the calm phase when we're working with the student. In the calm phase, if we take a look at a basic definition, this would be the student's typical or neutral state that you typically would see them in on a day-to-day -day basis. The student is cooperative, they're responsive to teacher and task demands. The goal at this point would be to keep the student productively engaged with instruction and learning in order to prevent the behavioral problems or any escalation of behavior. We always wanna make sure we're using all the really good explicit instruction techniques that we're also focusing on aspects of UDL, differentiated instruction, that we have good classroom management procedures in place. Hopefully in our curriculum, we're modifying, we're accommodating, we're providing specially designed instruction our students need academically so the tasks aren't too difficult, so they can be successful. We know that when one or two things, and we don't provide the student with the tools they need to be successful, we're probably going to see an increased anxiety and then an increase in the behavior of concern that we're trying to extinguish. So when they're on task, when they're challenged academically, when they're being successful, there's a less likelihood to see problem behaviors. And as we know as educators, quality of instruction is critically important. Now, some proactive teacher behaviors. We want to maintain positive relationships in the calm phase. 
We want to make sure the time and space is very structured, that it's predictable, there's routines, there's rules. Um, there's rewards for students following the expectations of behavior so they can be successful. Also, we want to teach active engagement success. We want to make sure that we're attending to the appropriate behavior in a five to one ratio. Um, we're providing contingent, basically non-contingent reinforcement. Also, think about the terms of immediate, random, and differential reinforcement. Those are really good tools and strategies to have in our toolbox as we work with students. The second phase that we talk about is the trigger. So in this particular definition, this would be the events that set off the cycle of acting out behavior. Triggers can be school-based, they can be non-school-based. When we think about triggers, we usually think about environmental triggers. Things in the environment that we want to work through with a student, reactions they may have to a certain circumstance that they encounter in their environment. So we want to have tools and strategies that also help us have the student decrease the anxiety when they're in a situation they feel uncomfortable with. So we don't see the acting out of the behavior as much. It's also important, very critical, to also really take the time to get to know the student as we know. We want to form trust, a good relationship. We want to have um, um, good ways to decrease their anxiety. Okay, so the ultimate goal then during this phase, we want to recognize the antecedent. We want to truly know our learners. And the goal is to prevent the behavior problem from occurring. So if we take a look at a little closed procedure, events that set off the cycle of acting out behavior are called. So what you want to do is you want to take a moment. We've been talking about triggers. So you're right if you chose triggers. Now we get into the next phase. We're talking about the agitation phase. Now, if we tried some verbal de-escalation techniques, we've tried some anxiety reduction techniques with the student to help them maybe start to become a little bit calmer. The goal is to not go up the ladder to peak, but actually to come back down. Um, and how successful are we are with regards to our knowledge of de-escalation strategies is what prevents that from occurring. So in the agitation, agitation phase, Student behavior is unfocused, they can be off task, they're starting to show indicators of anxiety, may involve increased behavior, you can see darting eyes, busy hands, moving in and out of groups. And as we know, when we sit back in the calm phase, you know your students well, so you'll be able to kind of have an indication of when they start to get to the agitation phase. It also may involve a decrease in certain behaviors, staring into space, withdrawal from groups, subdued language. Each student is a little bit different. Some students are very outgoing. And then if they become quiet, then we know they're just not at their neutral state. Something must be wrong. So then we want to try to intervene early in a preventative fashion. Again, the goal is to have them be successful. And as we know, there are no bad students. It's just to help these students along so they feel comfortable. They trust the adult that they can move along in this cycle of behavior and feel confident. So also in agitation, some other calming strategies would be let the student know you are aware there is a problem. Communicate empathy and concern. We're going to utilize behavioral momentum. We also want to help the student focus on the task, provide space, and allow the student to have a short break. Okay. Later, we'll talk about different strategies that we can employ that go along with these phases of behavior in the student to help them be successful and to get back on task, back on track. Some of the other calming strategies provide assurance, additional time if need be. Reduce situational demands, have them work on tasks that they can be successful with. And then later on, after they feel more comfortable and you see a decrease in anxiety, then we can get back to the expectation of that particular lesson um, and we can make it a little bit more rigorous. Again, we're trying to think smartly so we can help diffuse these behaviors. Uh, teach proximity is very important. Also independent activities, um, movement activities, things that they can do throughout the lesson that will allow them to exert some of that energy so they can kind of focus on the task at hand. And again, if the task is something they can complete and they can be successful at, they're less likely to have an increase in their behaviors. Also, we wanna talk about self-management strategies with the technique with the students. We wanna work with them after behavioral situation. And we wanna educate them on things that we saw in their behavior and what are different ways that they could um, feel more successful. And remember, the most important thing is really the only behavior we can truly control is our own. 
Now we're up to the acceleration phase. In the acceleration phase, we start to see student activity. They're starting to resist. They're starting to refuse. Verbal aggression, their threats, they're becoming more agitated with their behavior. This could be done verbally as well as physically. Violations of behavioral rules, student screams, you can't make me, student curses at you. Behavior can be provo pr provocative and designed to encourage staff to engage. And remember, we don't wanna fall into the behavioral trap. Sometimes certain behaviors we can ignore. Sometimes there's one we really truly need to intervene a little bit more quickly. Some of the important points in the acceleration phase we want to avoid escalating prompts. We want to make sure that whenever we talk to the student, we're talking to them with respect. We're maintaining all equity procedures with regards to working with the students. We want to be very calm. We want to be very respectful. I often, when I work with students, I always try to remember the most important thing is, is the student is not the behavior. And when we're working with the student, you know, John, I really like the way you do this. However, when you act like this, um, that's a concern. It's a safety issue. Also, you're off task and you're not being successful. Um, so remember, we want to make sure that we're very respectful and we keep the behavior irrespective of the student. Also, we want to approach the student in non-threatening manners. We also want to use non-confrontational limit setting with the student. Then when we get to peak phase, we become a little bit more concerned. Now we have a student that's starting really to act out. So student aggression to self and others can start to see property damage. Overall, the student behavior is completely out of control. They could start to fight property destruction, maybe assault another student. The goal here is to maintain safety. We always need to have a safe physical environment. We also want to communicate with our community um, coordination with regards to if a student is receiving outside support and they come into the school, you have your behavioral, um, you have a TSS support, behavioral specialist support, uh, mental health services that might be working with the student to help them. We want to have a team in place and we want to have a plan and we want to make sure that it's preventative. So when this situation occurs, we're ready. And again, the goal is to keep the student safe and the other students as well as us as well. Um, however, to do this, we also have to make sure we have a highly trained staff. We also want to teach the students in the classroom that these are our procedures that take place if somebody were to get upset. Um, we also want to make sure that the student has some sort of a classroom management program in place and also an individual plan. There's constant reminders throughout the day with regards to what the expectations are. And they can earn rewards for more positive reinforcement when they're engaging in the um, the behavior that we have for our expectation. However, if it does go bad, we also want to make sure that we have emergency procedures and a response plan for how we're going to deal with this. We also want to make sure that's clearly indicated in any school or district policies. Okay, also next, we want to make sure that in the peak phase that we protect ourselves, the student and the others as much as possible. We want to remove the other students from the classroom. Um, we also want to pause and assess the situation. If we have a certain um, term that we use to get our team to kind of come to our aid in that particular sense, you know, Mr. Green, Dr. Green is in the building, something that, that allows the team to have a realization that we have a behavioral situation that's pretty serious. Physically step away and send for help. We also want to block non-aggressively if necessary. The student would start to strike out at us. Then we get to de-escalation, probably one of the most critical phases also, as well as the others. During de-escalation, we start to see a reduction or a sensation of the aggression, reduced frequency or intensity of the behavior. Also, the student might feel a little bit confused. Um, they go through quite a general rush, rush when they're at this point. Um, also, some additional tips. Be cautious of your responses to the student who is de-escalating. De we wanna make sure that we don't say something that would kind of strike one of those behavioral triggers or those become an environmental trigger where it escalates the student's behavior all over again after we've spent a lot of trying time to help them de-escalate. Okay, then we have the reduction of the sensation of the behavior is called. And as we talk, that would be de-escalation. 
Now we're at the recovery phase. Now, some of the things that we see, student returns to calm, the student is eager to complete tasks, students reluctant to interact or talk. Also, this phase is necessary after a challenging behavior has occurred, where the student has some time to start to calm themselves. Remember, what we're doing is we're trying to go from calm up the ladder to peak, but we wanna get back to the, the calm phase as soon as we can, back to the student's neutral state. Then we start to take a look at some of the recovery. We start to take a look at transition back to the class, provide strong focus on routines again, attend to appropriate student behaviors. We wanna help the student focus on independent activities. We wanna communicate our support, what the expectations are. Again, what we're trying to do is we teach alternate responses for a later time. Also during the recovery phase, it's important to do a debriefing session. Now it's a proactive strategy designed to help the student be able to, student be able to problem solve through the escalated behavior. Also, we're gonna have a brief meeting. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at about 20 minutes after the student has been in the classroom, we're gonna have to pull them out and do a debriefing session before they get home, definitely before they go home, before the end of the day. We're gonna take a look at the actual event that occurred we we'll want to remind the student of other strategies they could have used instead of escalating, becoming anxious. Um, we can also go through some sort of a checklist. Remember, debriefing is not a consequence. It's meant to be a tool that we use to help the student get to a more comfortable place. And again, to get more engaged academically and to decrease those behaviors. So if we take a look at some specific strategies, um, essentially we talked about environmental antecedents what we want to avoid, behavioral event, um, antecedents or the signals that we see in the student. Okay, so during de-escalation, we also can call for assistance, move other students away, we're going to identify a team leader, we talked about having a plan, we want to remove potential weapons or items that could be used to harm someone else in the situation. We also want to make sure that we have an exit when we need to, we want to talk very quietly and we always want to be very calm with the student even when their behavior de-escalates. And some important points about de-escalation to remember. Remember that we will probably not make a very agitated person calm in one step. Sometimes what occurs is what you do may sometimes work well, have no effects or could actually make things worse. If the student becomes more agitated, we want to remember, we want to stop doing what we're doing we want to try something else. Now, some very helpful strategies that we can use. We also kind of have a ladder that was provided by QBS through safety care. And there are three evidence-based researched prompts that can be used or interventions to help the student if they're at the calm phase and we start to see they're going up the escalation ladder a little bit we can use the help strategy in about the middle. We're going to use the prompt. And when we get to the very top, when we think we have a true crisis situation, we want to use the wait strategy. So when we take a look at the help strategy, we also want to make sure that the student behavior may be communicating. Pay attention to me, listen, go away. You can see some other ones here as well. Okay, let me go. Give me something to eat or drink. Now, the important part here is how to use the help strategy. Approach safely, ask the student com to communicate in an appropriate way. In many situations, the best questions to ask is how can I help you? Use a very calm, use a very neutral tone. Allow five to 10 seconds for the person to process your request. Repeat the prompt if necessary. John, how can I help you? Again, if you have those tools in your toolbox and you know the student, and you know some strategies that you can use to have them de-escalate their anxiety at this time, those would be the times you want to use them. If the student makes a request and they start to communicate more appropriately, you want to try to comply with that. It's within, it's within your expectations. We also want to praise the student for appropriately engaging again. If the student does not respond with an appropriate request, then we're going to stop. When to use it. If the student has just started to exhibit mild or signs of agitation, if you're going to use this strategy, it's always better to do so early in the escalation cycle. If the challenge of behavior doesn't happen, very often. 
Now, sometimes it's not appropriate to use the help strategy. You would initially just go right to the prompt strategy or the wait strategy, depending on the severity of the behavior that you encounter with the student. Now we switch and we go to the prompt strategy. How to use the prompt strategy? Identify an incompatible or highly improbable probable behavior, what to prompt. You know, if you have a student getting upset, sit here in this seat, let's go get a drink of water. Well, you're giving them a prompt. You're giving them something to follow. You're not asking it in the form of a question. At that point, we want to approach safely, prompt with the desired behavior in a calm, neutral tone. It's important to allow about five to 10 seconds for the person to process your request. Repeat the prompt if you need to. Praise any compliance in this process. If non-compliant, then identify a different behavior and start all over. If the signs of agitation increase, then stop and consider switching to the wait strategy. Now, when to use the prompt? Help strategy we know has not been effective. The student is able to understand instructions and is likely to be compliant with separate requests. However, it's also important when to know when not to use the prompt strategy. If you attempt to prompt, an escalation increases. If you are concerned that the social interaction involving complying with the student being praised might reinforce a crisis behavior. Now, Probably one of the most important things about the WAIT strategy is to think about the acronym. Why am I talking? Now the student is at that peak phase. They're very excitable. They're becoming more verbally and physically aggressive. Sometimes it's best not to say anything. We allow the student to sit, we allow the student to rest and to just think through this process. But how do we use the WAIT strategy? Remove the other students and make sure the other staff won't accidentally intrude. Position yourself to be able to monitor the student without putting yourself at risk. Avoid reinforcing the behavior. Don't talk, don't give eye contact, or respond to any type of provocations. You want to be very calm, you want to very, be very neutral. However, if the student does show that they're starting to become a little less behaviorally excited, when they start to behave more calmly, then we can switch to the prompt strategy. We can start to interact again with the student. Now, kind of wrapping up de-escalation, remember de-escalation does not have a time limit. We may stay in the stage for quite a period of time. Also, student behavior is a factor in the behavioral chain. We also know that the use of diffusing strategies is sensible, it's a safe approach for problem solving. Um, we can diffuse or we can escalate. So we also wanna make sure that we don't get overly excited in a really difficult situation. Okay, and these are some of the resources we wanted to provide to you. Um, we want to thank you very much for your participation as well as your patience. We also, um, if we have time, we can answer certain types of questions. Um, we also realize though that, um, and as we say in a lot of our uh, patent presentations is, we're not here to give legal advice with regards to the use of um, behavioral techniques that we talk about or the de-escalation or when and when we should or should not use something if it turns to a legal nature. And also remember, this is just a bite of behavior. And we'll be continuing to create very informative behavior bite sessions for our audience as well as the educators and parents and as well as students too for the future. We also want to thank all of our participants with regards to behavioral initiative. Pat in Pittsburgh, Pat in Harrisburg, as well as Pat in East.